I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. What if, as a community, we could change the course of a young person's life by restoring justice, accountability, and relationship to the criminal justice system? The goals, learn about who this person is, and find what they need to do to make things right. And what happened here was very, very serious, because shoplifting is theft, and theft is a crime of dishonesty. Imagine a system where a teenager's peers ask the difficult questions. When you think about graduating high school, uh, what kind of plans do you have after that point? Welcome to Restorative Peer Court, a restorative justice program at the Center for Dialogue and Resolution, a local nonprofit agency. Some may refer to the process as teen court with a twist. I'm Christian Belshi, I'm 15 and I go to uh, Sheldon High School. I was going through uh, lots of things. I was diagnosed with depression. I was, I was sort of on a side where I didn't, I was, kind of in a self-destruct mode. <laughs> Being a teenager now in high school, you feel like you don't have any anybody you can talk to or anybody you can relate to. Because most people are like, oh, I know what you're going through, but like, really, they don't. Kristen is a quiet kid with a lot on his mind. Whenever I'm having a bad day, I just start playing music. I, put, start, I get on the drums, kind of zone out. After that, I just feel better. Kristen started stealing small stuff. Once I did it, I got away with it. I'm like, wow, I, d I thought it was going to be a lot worse than this. And I started getting this adrenaline rush, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to do it again. We want to get in early enough where we can get them to think about what it is that they're doing and hopefully have some actual changes in the neurons and et cetera of their brain uh, so that they won't make that decision. They'll make a different decision. In Lane County, juvenile crimes like shoplifting aren't prosecuted, and even if the money could be found to do so, the process is so different from restorative justice. We also, in the traditional system, don't ever ask somebody who's committed a crime to take responsibility for what they did. We just slap them on the hand, we punish them in some way, but we never ask them to take true accountability for what they've done. In restorative justice, that is the goal. Well, he'd been making some poor choices his freshman year and uh, kind of came to a head in May when um, he went to Market of Choice. Um, while school was going on, he checked into class, skipped class to go get some gum for his friends. As I was thinking, I was getting away with it again for like multiple times. Um, I get caught and the entire thing is just so unreal and I was scared. The main purpose of this program is to allow teens to help other teens learn from their offensive and take proactive responsibility for making things right. Before we go over the student volunteers serve on the panel. Many are from Student Leadership and Honor Society, but those in the hot seat also end up on the panel as part of their reparation. They introduced me to the program and everything, the uh, peer court, and that's where I got to see that's where I got to meet a whole bunch of kids that were just like me, that got into the same same situations, and they talked me through it, saying you that it gets better. Uh, more attractive to either sell them a or send them in the food bank to give out to people in need. Kristen's peers determined with him what he needed to do to make things right. Community service was part of his obligation, as well as journaling and serving on the court. The program has a 95% success rate. This approach is a community approach where we're saying, we don't think you're a bad person, you made a bad decision, you made a bad choice here. And if you're willing to take responsibility for it, uh, and willing to make things right again, we want you to come back into our community. We want you to be a, a standing, upright citizen. 
uh, and we're going to help you do that because we believe you can and we care about you. It's a totally different message than the traditional system, which is we're going to punish you because you're a bad person and we're afraid of you and we're going to send you away. They felt this opportunity for Zion to be held accountable while learning with their peers would be a beneficial process. Often, restorative justice processes bring the person who committed the crime face to face with the victim and others harmed by their actions, including his or her parents, to, to be able to trust him again. and others in the community. It's just amazing what it does. The person who had been harmed gets so much more out of it than in the traditional courtroom setting. Uh, where mostly what they get is maybe a sense of revenge if the person gets punished. Uh, but there's so much that the victims don't ever get from that process that they now do get. I think the process itself uh, provides opportunities to put back responsibility into the system, but accountability so your into the system, idea, right? relationships into the system, and most of all, just the ability to reduce crime and create a safer community. I was surprised that they were willing to open up and share and have the ability to say, hey, well, what about this? And they really got into, dug into the weeds as far as Christian's emotional status was and what our family dynamic was. Um, I was surprised by that. I didn't know that he was so open because he is pretty guarded at home. I didn't know he was going to be willing to be that open. Now I'm a part of it. We will talk about what we can do to make things right for you, uh, the victims involved, and the community. Uh, I get to see all these different stories, and I'm like, hey, it's OK. I was sitting in that exact same chair as you. And look at where I'm at now. Christian's service ended a long time ago, but he still chooses to serve on the peer panel. He says he found himself in the process. He found his value. Because it shows me that there are other kids out there that are like struggling the way I am. And I also get to help those kids too. And afterwards, I'm like, wow, I actually, I feel, I feel like, like I did something. gave this kid a hand and picked him back up. Don't hang out with people that'll peer pressure you. Hang out with people that follow you. Apology letter to mom, community service hours six, three panel participation nights, and the required shoplifting class. Is there anything you'd like to add to the agreement? Yes, I think that I should add an apology letter to the store It works team. because kids don't want to listen to adults and they want to listen to each other. May our actions positively impact our community. Restorative Peer Court also brings together kids from different places in life and that's helpful for both. It's a very eye-opening experience and it sometimes kids get very wrapped up in their own little in their own little world and you don't realize that there's you know a 15 year old girl out in the streets like bending for herself or a senior who is addicted to drugs and, and can't graduate high school. We don't realize the tragic lives that people have around us. I have one parent who, who, who told me, I, I recognize my kid again. And that was so powerful to me that this process was able to help heal a family that has been broken. Peer Court helps me by feeling like I had another chance, like I can redeem myself as a citizen of Eugene and help me repay back what I've done. Name a scenario right here. Have you ever been with your friends at home, hanging out, and you don't want to leave anywhere, but you guys are starving? You guys are like arguing like, oh, who delivers or whatever? We have a solution. 
a genius idea that someone came up with and it's HungryDucks.com. They have over 40 restaurants that you can pick and choose from. They go, they bring it to you, and it's so fast. You can actually track them on the internet. You just go on your computer and you can track them, and when they get here, HungryDucks.com. It's genius. Have you guys seen the new magazine out on the streets here in Lane County? I love this, it's Lane Monthly. It's in paper boxes and in just places all over where you find other newspapers. What I love about this is it's about the people and the places, events, and different products around the community that make this region such a great place to live. It's why we're all here. It's a lot like what Rick Dancer is trying to do on the TV show. But I love the feel of this and you look inside, there's gardening articles, different ways to celebrate Earth Day, and this is the last month issue. Just all kinds of a calendar of events. It is such a fun thing, and I love the way when you pick it up, it feels like kind of in between a magazine and a newspaper. You gotta check it out. It's locally produced, like locally published, and everything in here is local, Lane Monthly. You do not wanna miss it if you wanna know what's going on around town. In an era where newspapers are struggling and, and a lot of larger papers are dying, uh, we uh, are, are doing well because we tend to cover things local and we offer news that people can't get anywhere else. That, that's our model is covering local news and sports and anything to do with the community. Journalism and newspapers and uh, other media sources is important because uh, we have the training. Most of the people that I you know, employ have gone to college and studied journalism and so what we offer is um, a source of news that can be trusted. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, in an era where everybody's trying to be the first to get the news out, uh, we actually do some research and talk to the sources and get the, get the story and all the details behind the story. I, I have a lot of hope. I think it's exciting. That this is the first presidential race where it was actually exciting. It's, it's, I've, it's engaging to me. And maybe because there's a lot of views, a lot of things out there that need changing. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a fun race. Well, what I think it, what's making it really intriguing is people are throwing out political correctness. Because before, you know, it was born, no one can really trust a politician. You know, you know the things they say about politicians. But when people are coming out here and they're going with a whole new angle, they're relating with the people, and they're coming out here and they're throwing, throwing the political correctness out of the window, then it opens, up the win it opens up new doors for a whole bunch of different opportunities and a lot of things that should have been brought to light a long time ago that people were afraid about bringing out. Yeah, it's, it's more entertaining to me. I'm excited to see what's going on. I actually watched the political debate and I was excited about it. I was gonna ready to record it in case I wasn't able to make it home, and, and that's never happened. I've never done anything like that, so yeah, it's definitely, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older and things, issues like this are more touching to me now, but yeah, I'm definitely more intrigued and I'm definitely paying attention. My mom just called. I'm going to stay with my friends. My mom's picking me up later. Fine. Who's that? Nothing. Is that him? It's nothing. You know it's kind of creepy that he's texting you yeah. over and over again. He knows it. He knows you're with us. Hannah, I'm really worried about you. I really think we should tell someone. Is it a phone or a leash? Hannah, I'm really worried about you. We begin our journey tonight in a little ghost town. I bet you've passed through a hundred times on your way to Coos Bay. It's a little place called Scottsburg. They came from Ireland, France, and places in between. The early settlers of Scottsburg, Oregon. Silent now. Their history left behind on tombstones, in old pictures, and in stories revisited by those who still live here. He liked it here, people. Mm. 
Oh. This was raised in Scottsburg. There's a lot of them there that uh, I'd have to look. Uh, a lot of the old timers were there. We had some characters. And, uh, I guess every town does. <laughs> At one time, Scottsburg was a place where miners gathered supplies to head south to look for gold near Roseburg and beyond. They run uh, mule trains and pack trains from here to Roseburg. This was back in the 1800s, of course. It was an shipping port. It used to be the head of navigation, and sailing ships would come up there, and that's as far as up the river as they could get. On this day when we ran into Pat, his visit was not about Scottsburg or its history. It was home. And it, like I say, my mother and father, I got brothers, sisters, all buried here. As he carried the remains of his wife with him, this day was about his history, a period that had ended for him. You want to uh, get the history on Scottsburg, uh, talk to Henry Freer. He lives right there in town. He's the unofficial mayor. We'll come back to a little later. We found the mayor in what's left of Scottsburg just down the road a bit. The way Henry Freer tells it, his great-grandfather's brother walked to Scottsburg from San Francisco over a hundred years ago. How long has your family been here? Oh, it's 1851. So you, you are Scottsburg? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Scottsburg was named after a businessman named Levi Scott. Scott owned the mercantile. There used to be an upper, middle, and lower Scottsburg. The town was a center of commerce from the coast for those going south into California. This was the last stop for ship traffic. Two floods in 1861 wiped out the lower and middle sections of Scottsburg. The highway came in, everything changed. Instead of stopping, cargo just bypassed Scottsburg. Now dozens of families live in the hills and backcountry surrounding the area. Just a few, like Mayor Henry, live in town. Everybody does their own thing around here. So what keeps people here? The way I had it figured is uh, a guy just wants to stay here. There's always work to be done around the local area. Why run all over the state? That's what they want you to do, and I won't do it. Rugged individualists. I kind of like everything the way it used to be, and I don't like the modern day stuff. A place where the old ways work just fine. How is it decided who becomes mayor in Scottsdale? Well, it just happens. What do you mean it they just start, happens? Well, they start calling you mayor, and it just goes from there. A place where personal freedom outranks everything. I can kind of do what I want. I, I don't have to answer to anybody, more or less. I'm a freer, and I'm free right here. A place where anyone can be mayor. And well, I don't know if I ain't going to be around for it. Scottsburg, Oregon. A place people like Pat Thomas come back to forever. What's her name? Barbara. How long were you married? Uh, almost 52 years. Can I ask you something? Sure. What are you going to miss the most about her? Just miss everything about her, really. She's a special, special lady. Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. What's happening downtown Eugene? Well, what's happening is the Eugene Film Society for the third year in a row is doing the 72-hour film competition. and The horror film competition. Horror film, horror film competition. Film competition yeah. So this is big stuff. It is for us, yeah. It's the first event that sort of kicked off what would become the Eugene Film Society. Uh, it's always great to come back in and check in with this event. We do a large uh, downtown event around the horror film competition called All Hallows Eugene. It's a downtown Halloween event. It includes film screenings and costume parades, trick-or-treating, and a bunch of family and youth-oriented activities during the day and more young adult activities at night. But the horror film competition, it's going into its third year. We have uh, two great prizes, a jury prize and audience award, each valued at $1,000 wow. and will be given away. Uh, it's a great chance for local filmmakers to get engaged in the local film community and participate in a 72-hour competition. 
uh, that's energizing, exciting, and a great opportunity to connect with the local film community. So and this is Joshua Purvis. We didn't introduce you with the Film Society because yes, we, we're so used to each other. We just kind of jump right in there. Um, tell me, in terms of this, is really good for young filmmakers and, and old, but young yeah, also yeah. getting some new blood in there, some people that yeah. are kind of test out their skills because that, that's tough to do in seventy-two hours. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, certainly it's a it's a certainly a challenge. And I know for a number of people, when we say it's a horror film competition, it sort of gets pegged as a niche sort of genre, but the way we try to view the genre in terms of this competition is that it encourages sort of uh, ingenuity, risk-taking, creativity. And so it's an opportunity to really allow artists to dig it deep into the reserves of the unconscious, uh, into their imagination, with the intent to have an effect on the audience. You know, with horror, if you're not scaring somebody, if you're not disturbing someone, if you're not making someone feel uneasy, you're not doing your job. So the horror film competition is very much about getting results uh, from an audience for your work as a filmmaker. So for people in Eugene who, like myself, who, when mm -hmm. we don't produce a film, yeah, yeah. we get to come and be judges, we get to come watch this and see oh, how yeah. it works. Tell, how, when does that sure. work and how, how do we get involved in that? Yeah, so Halloween night, 7 p.m. at the Holt Center, we're going to screen all the submissions in the competition. Oh, awesome. Uh, the audience will be able to vote on their favorite film and help determine the audience award winner. So how do you think this helps in, in Eugene for, um, we have quite a growing community of film fanatics and, more and more, yeah. producers yeah. and video yeah. producers. How do you think this helps them to kind of get that, that, that competition under their belt? Sure, well one, it's just more content created, right? So something on your portfolio, they're able to share. Uh, we always have meet and greets uh, held right before the competition where we invite actors and supporters of the local film community to come and get engaged in the filmmakers and it creates an opportunity for filmmakers to then resource actors, crew, uh, financiers, whomever else, whether for this production or for future productions. Uh, so there's certainly a networking aspect, there's a creation content aspect to it. There's also a celebration component where we come together as a community and participate in the viewing of these films, celebrate the successes and uh, find ways to sort of generate support for those filmmakers going forward. Well, it's fun for the audience too because we get to go um, kind of help push these people yeah. and tell them what, what we liked and what we didn't like. Yeah. So how do, if I'm a film producer out there, yeah. how do I get involved? Sure. Where do I get a hold of you? Sure, so you can find all the information about the competition on the Eugene Film Society website, eugenefilmsociety.com. There we'll have the registration form so filmmakers get involved. Uh, this year, we're actually launching a sort of uh, preliminary workshop going into the competition. We're very fortunate to be working with Albert Krim, who's a screenwriter out of the uh, prestigious American Film Institute, who's going to offer a workshop on how to write an effective short horror film. Um, registration in the class automatically enrolls you in the competition. Okay. Uh, so it's a good way to sort of prime the pump, so to say. Uh, get this creative juices flowing so that at the uh, competition kickoff when we announce the mandated line of dialogue and prop uh, filmmakers are better prepared to receive that information, jump into the screenwriting process, and go ahead and expedite that so they can start the production process. And for the rest of us who want to come watch and participate yeah. downtown in the, the night. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. Yeah. What, how, do we, how do we find more about that? Sure, so there's going to be a full day of programming on Halloween. Uh, we have a two o'clock screening of Paranorman, which is an animated film, feature-length film, uh, produced by Leica that's based right outside of Portland and Hillsboro. Uh, Leica's actually been nominated for Academy Award for huh. another one of the animated films. Uh, but not only are we going to screen the, uh, the film Paranorman at the Holt Center, we're also going to have Georgina uh, Haynes, uh, head of puppetry from Leica, come down and do a special presentation accompanying the screening. Uh, so that's again at 2 o'clock. Uh, following the screening, we'll have uh, trick-or-treating and a costume parade. Uh, later in the evening, we're going to have a screening at the horror film competition at the Holt. Uh, there will also be a screening of Nosferatu with a live performance by Mood Area 52 with Bijou Art Cinemas. Uh, and there will be a number of other programming going on that night in downtown Eugene. So film screenings, trick-or-treating, uh, costume parades, there'll be art exhibits, there'll be a lot going on on Halloween in downtown Eugene. So it all happens. Downtown. <laughs> yes, sir. Joshua, thanks. Absolutely appreciate it, Rick.
Michael Coombs, and I'm here to talk about the special thing on Rick Dancer TV that he has all set up with Ranchito Grill over off of Mohawk in Springfield. They have a $6.95 lunch special, and I'm telling you, this is the best Mexican food in the area. It's so delicious. But they have us, they're giving away two free dinners. All you have to do is go there, sign up, and you can win two free dinners, and it's so delicious, I'm telling you. Go down there, check it out. Rick Dancer TV. So, do you like really scary stuff at Halloween? I mean really scary. I'm talking zombies, paintball, dark, you and five friends. It's happening out in Harrisburg. They did it last year. Scared the bejeebers out of people. Nobody under 10 gets in. You should call 541-285-0073. They also have a Facebook page you can check out. And this is every weekend in October, starting Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They're even doing one on the first this year because it was so popular last year. This isn't a maze. This isn't some little haunted hayride. This is real, real scary. So sign up unless you're too scared. <laughs> I have the best job in the world, you know, to, to hold a letter written by George Washington when he was president of the United States. I mean, how many Americans get to even just do that, you know, and to be the person who takes care of that material? You know, it's a fabulous job. It, it's like all stored away in our stacks, you know. Uh, yeah, just fabulous stuff. People could come in and use the Ken Kesey papers, the papers relating to um, Pacific Northwest literature, um, to learn about the migration of people from the Midwest to the West and the Oregon Territory in the 19th century in original Oregon Trail Diaries. I mean, people can come here and sit down and use these original documents, you know? It's like we've got this treasure trove of material. They don't really know that they have the right to come here to use these collections. You know, and you don't even have to be affiliate, affiliated with the university. Anybody could come and use these collections in special collections in university archives, yeah. One last thing I want to remind you about is Rick Dancer Media Services. We do a lot of things, everything from social media to videos for YouTube, videos for our show, videos for your website. We can produce a show from your location. Give us a call. We're really reasonable and we want to get the message out and help you. And so give me a call. My phone number is right there on the screen or go to my website, rickdancer.com or rickdancer.tv and let me know what we can do for you. Hey Rick, how about a little FaceTime? This is my lucky day. Donald's breakfast all day! <laughs>